Episode 186, Teaching Your Teen to Advocate for Themselves with Daylene Byam. Welcome to Latter Day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints and a highly trained, experienced life coach making a great impact in the lives of their clients. And together, we have one main goal helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. Our goal as parents is to raise children that can go out into the world and be successful, independent, and self-sufficient adults. But in order for this to happen, parents need to allow their children to learn the vital skill of self-advocating when they are still living at home. Coach Daylene Byam is on the podcast talking about how parents can teach their children to advocate for themselves by learning how to manage their emotions as well as deal with failure. Daylene believes the home is where these skills are taught the most effectively as parents allow their children to be independent as well as show them how to be emotionally resilient and how to deal with failure by mirroring it for them. If you have a teen that you feel could use help learning to self-advocate, be sure to reach out to Daylene and let her guide you in this process. Enjoy this episode. Well, everybody, welcome to the podcast today. Glad to have you with us. And I am very glad to be joined by Coach Daylene Byam today. Hey, Daylene. Hi, Heather. How are you today? I'm fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> I know our weather is beautiful. We're recording this a little bit sooner than when it's releasing and we're just kind of starting to get some beautiful weather and I just kind of, it's, it's nice to kind yeah. of feel like you're coming alive. Yeah. Yeah. Our good weather. We had a blimp of it and now it's back. So hopefully it's here to stay. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's not. At least if, for me, <laughs> it, it'll go, it'll be bad again. Daylene's in Canada, just a little bit more. I'm in Idaho, but, and you're like North of us, right? In, yes. You're in Alberta. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're the same, but I'm always hopeful. <laughs> uh-huh. I know we all, we all can be so, all right. I've, I've said a little bit about you, at least where you're from, but before we continue, I should have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you a little bit more than just where you're from. So Daylene, can you give us a little bit yeah. of an introduction? Yeah, sure. I'm a coach for teens with, well, teens and young adults that struggle with anxiety. I've been doing this. I had to look it up five years now. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Is that crazy? I don't think I've committed to anything besides the church <laughs> or my kids for five years and my husband, I guess. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a long time. So I'm super impressed with myself for that one. Good job. <laughs> and I know. <laughs> and I still love it, which is so shocking to me too, because I just love what it does. So I have, like Heather said, I live up in Canada. We live actually out on some land, which I love. I love the peacefulness of it and everything, but it does cause us to do a lot of driving, which is also great, actually, in the end. And we'll maybe talk about that a little bit as we go along here and talk about teenagers. But um, I have four boys. Um, My oldest lives two hours south of us. He lives with his partner up there and is working and applying for his master's degree. Our other two, our middle two are two hours did I say South? He's North, they're South. Okay. The boys, the other boys are, are South with their wives. And we just had our first grandbaby. So loving that. And then our youngest, Heather and I were just talking about this, just got his mission call yesterday. And he's just finishing off his last year of high school. So, and then we'll be empty nesters in September, which is so so crazy. <laughs> that is so crazy. But I think any day anymore, like if we're empty nesters, but the kids tend to need to come back eventually at some point in time, right? It's really hard for them to. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, this is a hard economy for them to just be on, totally. like not have any assistance in some ways. So yeah, usually yeah. they come back in some way. <laughs> I'm fully expecting it. My one son that just had the baby he said, he sent me these stats Mm -hmm. about like 52% of kids have to move home at one point between the ages of this. And he's preparing you. (laughs) I I was like, I sent him the text back. What are you moving in with me with your baby? I'm so excited. And he's like, no mom, no mom. But (laughs) I just found these stats and I was like, oh, you got me excited for a minute because 
that would be amazing. But yeah, we love it. <laughs> well, if only yeah. you could be so lucky to get that ground baby yeah. under your roof. It's oh, so seriously. Fun. Yeah. And so the reason I'm coach with anxious teens and young adults is because of my son that is the dad now. <laughs> he really, really struggled with anxiety through junior high, high school and into college. And it was with help from a coach that he's really been able to do so well. And I mean, the, the, the dad, the kid still feels anxious, right? And, and all the time, but he just manages it so well now yeah. because he's, he's really developed these tools that have helped him not let it hold him back and not keep him back. And that's why I love, I love seeing his progress with it all. And I love seeing my clients progress with it all. And just like knowing that you can still feel anxious, but still do all these amazing, wonderful things and, and not let it hold you back. So, yeah. So amazing. Like we all have so much to offer and give in this world. And sometimes we're not able to because we have these things that hold us back. And it is amazing to be able to help people discover what's in them and have the ability to then live in that when they can, when they can work through and get the help that they need. Yeah. Yeah. My favorite is when you just see the light bulb go off in their mm -hmm. head and you're like, oh, they got it. They can see, yes. they can see that what we yep. were talking about. They can, they can see it now. It's just, oh, so satisfying. <laughs> it is. It's really satisfying. So anyway, I'm glad I'm so glad the world has you. I feel that way about every coach that comes on to talk with me. It's like, I'm just so glad that we, that this is available to people. I was actually hiking with some friends this morning and they were like, what you do wasn't available to people when we were younger. And I'm like, oh no, no. this is a very new thing. And aren't we, aren't we blessed? Aren't we happy that yeah. we have it? Oh, a hundred percent. I remember turning to my husband when I always call my anxious kid. <laughs> he knows I do this. <laughs> it's fine. But I remember he's like, he was very top athlete, captain of his basketball team, that kind of stuff. And I remember sitting, watching him play in our high school gym and looking at my husband and saying, there's got to be something to help this kid. Mm -hmm. There's got to be someone, some kind of program, something that can help him with his mind and what's going on in his head while he's out on the basketball court, because you can see it just sabotaging his game out there. And we could see it. And other people would just see this kid blowing up and getting frustrated and getting mad or whatever out there, right? And thinking that he's, you know, a hothead, which he was, mm -hmm. but we could see that there was something else going on there. And and I just said, there's got to be something out there. And there wasn't. There really, mm -hmm. there maybe yeah. was, but it wasn't really well known. And now there is, like, it just gives me goosebumps. There's something out there now to help with yeah. these things, with our teens, with our young adults, with our with us, right? Yeah. It's just in, amazing. Yeah. Us in general. They, and one of the, um, one of my friends actually said so many people need the help that this can offer. And I'm like, no, all the people, all mm -hmm. the people need the help mm -hmm. that this can offer is because we like, for me, I didn't really think I needed help in any way, but when I kind of stumbled upon it and started really diving in, I didn't have any idea what I was missing out on. I had no idea how much better things could be. Right. And anyway, so oh, I know I just feel like I don't really second guess myself too often because it's just my personality, but I just really feel like I've just up leveled my, my game with all my relationships, mm -hmm. like with my relationships with, with my mom, my relationships with my husband, and especially with raising my kids, like it just has up leveled to be able to have that, those tools in your back pocket, right? Ready to go. <laughs> For sure. It's a total gift. So, yeah. Well, and I think this leads us really well into what we kind of want to talk about today. You know, most people listening today are likely parents. They have children that are either left the house or in the house, or like you and me, we have kids that are leaving our houses at this point in our lives. And we want them to be independent and functioning adults in society which I think sometimes we take for granted that that's just going to happen. Like that mm -hmm. it's just going to, they're going to leave our home and they're going to just know exactly what to do. And we all have a different definition, I think, too, of independent and functioning adults. So what, totally. what does it mean to you to be independent? What, like, what does that look like for you? How would you define that? Um, I feel like it's that they can, well, take care of themselves, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. That they can 
you know, go buy groceries, like just basic stuff, the basic too, things. right? The yes. basic things, but also that they can advocate for themselves when they need to. Or I feel like when I'm talking to people whose kids are struggling on like a mission or at school or whatever, a lot of it is they just can't advocate for themselves. They don't know how to stand up for themselves mm-hmm. or say what they need or, or say that they don't need that. Mm-hmm right? Or to ask yeah. people to stop doing something, right? They just really, really have a hard time for that. Um, I think managing their emotions is a big one. But I mean, look at how many adults in the world don't know how to manage their emotions. Oh, yeah. Most of <laughs> us, right? Like shocking. Even shocking. when we do know how to manage them, it's still <laughs> difficult. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like we were at, I was just we were talking before about my brother-in-law just ran this massive basketball tournament. And it's shocking to me how many parents did not know how to manage their emotions. I was oh. just like, wow. <laughs> that is the setting. Like a tournament like that, that involves your, <laughs> that involves children. You see emotions heightened to like a, a competitive um, setting like that. It becomes pretty crazy. It was so, some of it was so crazy. And I was just like, Wow. Wow. Yeah. Anyways. And then learning how to deal with failure. And that kind of goes with that thing too. Right. Like, mm-hmm. like I feel like they, I, we either crumble or like our, our young adults are crumbling with when they fail at something or they just like lose their minds. Like they just mm-hmm. are like, they just don't even know how to handle failure. Right. Like mm-hmm. it's so, it's so hard. They like almost like we quite often I feel like if you fail at something, you struggle at something, like you go out on a mission and you come home early, you, you apply for a a degree or whatever, and you don't get in or you flunk at something or whatever, they kind of turtle. Right. And they just kind of, it just, they stop, they stop doing anything. It's just so interesting to watch. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is also then one of those things that keeps them from being able to, what we talked about previously is like living what they have to offer. They're not able to give what they have to offer because they let that, that one moment in time stop them from, I mean, hold them back from being able to try again or do it. It's, it's interesting to watch. And I see those tendencies in myself. Like it's not unusual for us to be, you know, when something doesn't happen the way we think that it should, we have a tendency just to give it, well, it must've just not meant been meant to be then or whatever. We have a tendency to just shut down, but. Right. Right. And I don't know that there's anything wrong with that for a minute or a bit. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I feel like some of our kids are just really, and thankfully I haven't had this with my own kids yet, but I expect it maybe could. Right. Oh yeah. They just kind of, yeah. Shut right down. Hmm. And and then the advocate, being an advocate for themselves. That's an interesting one too. I think some kids are better at that than others. Just, mm-hmm. I think that's just more almost personality type, maybe those that are able to, but it's always uncomfortable. Yeah. Here's the thing. I don't know that it's a personality thing. Like, I think it is a little bit like uh-huh. some kids know how to advocate, but I think it can be taught. And this is why is because like, I know I'm referring back to this, this tournament was such a big thing that we had going on, but there was a little girl that came up, me and my sister-in-law were running a, con- we're running this concession for a while. And, and this little girl, she's like six or seven came up to do, make her order with her mom of what she wanted. And her mom prompted her the whole way, but she did the whole thing, what she wanted. Yeah. And, and her mom had to help her a little bit because she was little and she was super quiet but I could totally see what mom was trying to do here, right? She was mm-hmm. trying to teach her to be able to advocate for herself. And and I thought, it's. I love that I saw this because I was like, this is what I'm going to be talking about with Heather. So perfect. But at yeah. six or seven, this mom is teaching her how to advocate for herself. And it was uncomfortable for her, 100%. You could see it, right? Mm-hmm. And so I just made it as easy and as possible and as good for her and just talked to her, not to the mom, right? Right. Because that's what she was trying to teach her to do. And I just think if we can teach them this at, at a younger age, that they can do it, that, yeah, this is uncomfortable, but you can do it. And she, and and it's not like mom pushed her up there and was like, you have to do this. You're on your own, blah, blah, blah. Her mom sat right, stood right beside her, gave her little prompts, helped her figure it out and helped her do it. And, and obviously some is going to be smaller steps too, right? Like maybe one time the mom would have to be like, 
okay, so my daughter's going to make her order here. She's going to tell you what she wants, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it started that way with her too, right? And this was her next step was her talking, doing all the talking with her mom prompting in her ear kind of thing. Like it's baby steps, but yeah, sometimes I agree. I have kids that could advocate for themselves. No problem. Didn't have to do anything for it. Like walk up to the front of the line, tell them what you want. No problem. But I do think that it is a learned thing for some kids and that we need to be teaching it to them so that they can do it. Mm -hmm. So that when you go into the doctor's office, I don't know if this happens to you, but when I was even with my 16 year old in the doctor's office, the doctor's asking me the questions. And I'm like, why the heck are you asking me the questions? Mm -hmm. It's their body. (laughs) Ask them. And so I would always turn to them and go, well, (laughs) and let them talk, right? Like Mm -hmm. even from a very young age, this is your body. You're here about something going on with you. Yeah. Talk to the doctor, right? But we're, mm-hmm. but as a society, we're so used to talking to the parent because oh, it's sure. faster and it's easier, right? This poor little girl's holding up the whole freaking line. And I'm sure there's people that are annoyed, right? <laughs> it's just so much easier for us to just do it for them and faster. <laughs> yeah. Until like, I'm thinking of the doctor's office until when they turn 18 and then all of a sudden they, they won't talk to you anymore. They want you to pay the bill, but you can't talk to them until, and tell them anything, or they won't tell you anything about your child either. I always think it's such an interesting contradiction there. <laughs> yeah. I think they're way stricter in the States about that than they are up here, uh, mm-hmm. but oh, they are, I mean, I don't know how, what it's like there, but here it's, it's kind of silly. So yeah. 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 Totally. I don't know. Um, okay. So sounds simple, right? That sounds like a simple thing to do and something that some of us probably don't even think twice about, but it's something we can be intentional about letting yeah. them yeah, advocate for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think we just have to think about it, right? Like how can I help my child learn to advocate for themselves? Because sometimes it's just such a habit to not. Yeah. So why do you think it is hard for parents to teach these kind of these basic skills that we've, that we've talked about? Cause they are seem, they do seem basic, but why does it, why is it hard for us? I think because we want to make things easy for our kids and we feel like it should like that. It's, it's super easy for us to do that. Right. Mm-hmm. So easy for me to just go up and order the food for my child or to tell the doctor what's wrong. Like it's super easy. And if we feel like they're uncomfortable, then we're like, Oh, I don't want them to feel uncomfortable here. So I'll just do it for them. Cause it doesn't make me feel uncomfortable. So we feel like we're kind of protecting them. Is this term? I don't know if you've ever heard the term, like the snowplow parent, we're like yes. moving all their obstacles out of the way for them. Mm-hmm. Cause we feel like if we can move all the obstacles away for them, then they'll be able to progress so much faster and do so much better. But in reality, it's doing the opposite, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the problem is, is they don't have these little obstacles that they've had to hit when they're younger, that when they're older, they hit an obstacle and then they stop. They can't even move because the obstacle hasn't been moved for them. They don't know how to move it. Mm -hmm. They don't know what to do. So I think as parents, we're trying so hard to make it easy. We feel like life is so hard for these kids. Like, what can I do to make it easier for them? But in the end, we're doing the opposite we're making it so freaking hard for them when they get older, because then they're like, I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I don't know how to advocate. Or I don't know how to fail. I don't know how to have uncomfortable emotions and be okay with it. Yeah. Because I've never had to do that because my parents take care of it for me. Yeah. Do you find I, there's, there's a, a tricky balance, I guess, that I see there because there is on one hand, like, what is fail and how hard do you want them to fail? And when is the appropriate time to jump in when, when need be right? I think it gets, it gets, there does have to be a time too, when we're like, okay, like I'm here, I'm a soft place for you to land. I can help you too. So figuring Mm -hmm. that balance out can be a little bit tricky. Yeah, totally. And nobody knows your kid like you do. Mm -hmm. I just think you have to really decide like, what can I let them fail at? That's going to be okay and isn't going to be a permanent thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like you got to decide, is this a permanent failure or just a, a a failure that can be fixed eventually? Right. right? Like even failing a class that can be fixed. Flunking out of high school that can be fixed. Right. True. Yep. Like most of it can be fixed. And so I think we have a really hard time with it because we feel like it's such a terrible thing. 
especially school. I feel like parents have such a hard time letting their kids fail at school. Like it really can be fixed. They really can't. There's, there's colleges that have 99% acceptance rate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that all the parents at my children's high school are like, can this parent take a little bit more effort, like have a little bit more input into the, cause I'm a very off hands-off person when it comes to my kids school, like they are in charge, they do it. Yeah. And sometimes, in fact, my kids have said to teachers before, Hey, will you just email me and not my mom? Because my mom, she just emails it to me anyway. And is like, take care of this. <laughs> or my right? mom doesn't read her emails that come from the school. So I don't know. There's probably a balance there too, that I haven't met, but it's, Oh, it's no, that <laughs> I'm that way too. So I have no judgment here. <laughs> Because <laughs> we just had parent teacher interviews. I don't do you guys do uh -huh. that? Yeah, we and do. I was, Not so I much just in kinda, high school, but oh yeah, we told in high school. And I just turned to him and I said, Do I need to do this? Like you're he's 18, right? Like yeah. he's turned 18. I'm like, you're 18. This is ridiculous. Like, yeah, why do I need to be meeting with your teacher, with your mommy? <laughs> <laughs> Because legally, like you have no recourse really anyway, right? If he's 18, especially like, it's not like you can. Well, you know, when we lived in the city with our older kids at 18, they really, they cut you off, like the attendance thing, everything. But with yeah. this kid in this country school, I don't know why it's different, but they're like, you get all the information still. I'm like, what? I don't want all I the don't... information. <laughs> I don't want it. No more responsibility. Oh, He's my like, gosh. can you call in for me? I'm going to skip. And I'm like, no, I'm not freaking calling in for you. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to the point where I tell my daughter, listen, if you're going to skip school, I need you to call the school and tell them, tell them it's me if you want to. I mean, you have to tell them it's me, but I'm tired of calling the school. You right? just got to call and say that you're excusing Summer Rackham from school. These are moms with our with our tail end kids, right? Yes, <laughs> our last children. <laughs> oh my like God. we're so done with this. I so know. yeah, I think like if they're if it's going to physically harm them, then yes, you are not going to let them fail at that, right? Right. If it's going to physically harm someone else or hurt somebody else, I think you wouldn't let them fail at that. But the rest of it, I don't know. You really have to make a, a decision yeah. on that for yourself. But I feel like, and this is so hard, and I'm not saying I'm good at this in any shape or form. I wish I was better at it, but like maybe they just need to fail at it, right? Mm -hmm. And then just say, hey, looks like you're struggling here. What can I do to help you with it? What do you need from me to help you with this? Because it may be that they don't care. <laughs> Oh, for sure. So why are you caring so much about it? Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think it's just more of a conversation there. Like you're really struggling here. I can see that it's starting to go sideways <laughs> in this <laughs> class or for work or whatever. Like you're not showing up for work, your part-time job, whatever, or for your school team. Like it's kind of going sideways here. What's going on here? And what can I do to help you? Yeah. What do you need from me? How can I support you here? Yeah. Or what can we do together? And it can't be you swoop in and take over. Like they can't. And most of the time, I don't think a teenager is going to say that. Can you just take this over for me? <laughs> well, some of them, I'm like looking at maybe my kids probably. But. <laughs> but but I think if you're like, how can I support you? Absolutely. Not how can I take this over for you? How can I fix this for you? Because you don't want to just come in and fix it. Maybe you do, but you we hopefully don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, Want communication, to. I think, becomes key there, right? Our ability to communicate and even using specific words, just like what you just said, rather than what can I do, but how can I assist you, right? Like it's, mm -hmm. we have to choose our words wisely, but communication, I think, um, how do you think that parents can best foster that, that, um, culture of open communication so that our kids can yeah. know what we're expecting and, and they can kind of know what we will and aren't willing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think that's something again, that starts from a pretty young age. I mean, obviously I think you can start any of these things at any age, like anything is better than, than not, mm -hmm. but I do think it is something that you start from a young age and, and having that open communication with your kids. I remember, um, one of my future daughter-in-law is sitting at our table and the conversation that was going on at the table. And she just kind of looked at me and was like, cause we're the only girls sitting at the table. And it was a little bit masculine kind of conversation. And she's like, you guys talk about this kind of stuff. And I'm like, 
yeah, there's, there's nothing that we don't talk about here. And it's, <laughs> it's like open with everybody. It was like the older brothers talking to the younger brother about certain things that he should or shouldn't be doing. <laughs> uh- <laughs> <laughs> and it was pretty funny and comical, but yeah, like just anything was open to us, to my kids growing up. Like we talked about everything and anything, but I do think you need a foster opportunity for that too. And yeah, that's, an, that's a good distinction because like it can be there, but if the opportunity, they have the ability to talk about it, but if the opportunities aren't there, yeah, that's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. And one of the things is we never say, I can't talk right now to our kids. Like if they're ready to talk, we have to drop everything and just talk like nothing comes because sometimes some of your kids aren't going to be talkers, right? Some of my kids talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and wouldn't stop. But I just, I really tried really hard to never shut them down when they were talking to me. And, but we also really created opportunities for them to talk. And one of the things that we did is our kids had snow removal. We get a lot of snow, obviously snow removal routes around the, the public mailboxes, like where everyone goes and picks up their mail. We had to remove the snow. So every time it snowed, they had to, and this is how they made money for their missions too. They all paid for their missions doing this, but it would create hours and hours of one-on-one time because my husband would take a crew and I would take a crew. And quite often it was late at night and we only had the oldest boys with us and the other ones would be asleep in the back of the the suburban or whatever, Uh (laughs) but but it would give opportunity for one-on-one conversation. And sometimes it wasn't a ton and sometimes it was a lot, but we created this opportunity for them to be able to talk to us. And sometimes it was just, we'd sit there listening to a comic, you know, a comedian, and we'd just be listening to a comedian and chatting back and forth about some of the jokes they were saying and stuff like that. But it just created opportunity for them to talk to us Mm -hmm. because you're there for two hours and same with driving. Now that we live in the country, we drive for like an hour to get to sports stuff, right? It just creates such opportunity to have those conversations and for them to talk to you. Cause they, what else are they going to do? Sometimes they sleep. <laughs> yeah. But it just gives them that opportunity to talk. And the other thing we've always done is wait. I, okay. I don't do it anymore. Cause I'm so freaking tired, but we used to wait up for them to come home and they would come and talk and talk and talk. Right. And no matter how tired we were, (laughs) just let them talk. I think you just have to create these opportunities to do it. One of my boys, he would always say he loved food. He just loves good food. And he'd always go, mom, can we go for lunch today? I think I spent a billion dollars on this kid for, for going Mm -hmm. out for lunches, but it was yes. Every single time Mm -hmm. because it gave opportunity for me and him to go for lunch and chat and talk. So and we even went, if you didn't talk, it's like, he knows that mom's there when I need her. Yeah, totally. Right. And he was my most talkative because we had these lunch dates all the time. I bet you once a week we went out for lunch. So, but he just wanted good food and I was, yeah. and I just wanted to hear what he had to say. Yeah. Well, and I, I think that that's important to recognize like this kid, like that was when you talked to him. And I learned a little too late that one of my children who I thought was not very talkative was extremely talkative, but it wasn't until the late hours of the night. And Mm -hmm. I was always asleep, but the siblings would be like, oh, we find he, you know, like this kid talks nonstop at midnight. And I was like, "Hmm, well, maybe I did things wrong with that child. I should have maybe stayed up later so that I didn't miss out on that. But I, I think we do have to kind of start to pay attention to their them and and their yeah. the, how they communicate when they communicate yeah I think that's different too oh yeah totally like like maybe your kid really loves watching like all the funny reels and stuff or the TikToks and stuff and start sending them ones that you think are funny and most of the time my kids are like mom that one was really stupid <laughs> but it's still like a connection right like right. you're talking about it after like even my kids say mom that one was really dumb like why did you send us that one <laughs> But then they're talking to you about it, right? Absolutely. And so just find something that you connect with them. One of my boys, my son right now loves to play pickleball. So we'll go and over to the church and play pickleball together. And so just find something that you, that you connects you with them. That even if you hate pickleball or I like, I don't love sending reels. And I don't like watching reels of people doing stupid stuff. Like I, I don't have any interest in that whatsoever. People hurting themselves and everyone thinks it's so funny, but my kids think it's the most hilarious thing in the world. So like, I like 
send them a stupid reel with somebody mm-hmm. hurting themselves and they think it's so funny. <laughs> yep. But there's some connection there. So, right. Yeah. Cause, Cause then they're like, Oh mom, you sent that one. It was a really good one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Not very many things that we do to our kids think we actually did a good job on. So gosh, yes, yes. Doing good and if you get I that posted, I posted this. What did I do? Oh, my son's mission call. He just opened it yesterday. There was this, it was like hardcore rapping song on call to serve or something like that. But my kids are like, do it, do it, mom, put that with, put that in your story, put that in your story. So they just thought it was so great that I, it was so ridiculous. So I put it in my story. <laughs> And I'm sure all the adults are like, what is Daylene doing here? (laughs) Well, what I just did is I posted it being at a baseball game, one of my son's baseball games and um, his walk-up song, if you don't use the edited version is quite explicit. Well, I put his walk-up song as the background, but I forgot to put the edited version on there. So I started getting, Hey, did you listen to the song you posted? And I'm like, yeah, I know that there's, I know what it is. It's my kid's walk-up song. I hear it all the time. But then I got to looking, I was like, oh yeah, wrong one. <laughs> like so my sister goes, the best part was, was that the text, the image, but the story before was of Christ. And then the very next one was like, <laughs> I'm like, perfect. We're just doing the best we can here. Okay? I know we are. Gosh, we're getting sidetracked, but. Anyway, <laughs> okay, daily. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe this will all get edited out. We'll see what Meg decides to do with us. Um, all right. So in your experience working with teens, what would you say the top three things you see a lot of them struggling with when it comes to independence? Yeah, I think um, really is the top three that I was kind of thinking about these. What are the top three? I feel like there's quite a few, but the top three is really Anxiety, I think anxiety really holds them back a lot Mm -hmm. with being independent. They're feeling so anxious and they feel like when they're feeling anxious, they can't do things, right? Like they're like, I can't do that. I'm feeling anxious. So they have to kind of stop, right? Mm -hmm. The second one is that fear of failure. They're so worried that they're going to fail at it, that it's just almost easier to not do it, which is so interesting because that feels so terrible to not do something that they want to do. I feel like it almost feels worse than failing at it. Yeah. Right. Like, like they fail. I love one of my favorite phrases is like failing ahead of time. Like totally you, just... you failed anyways yep. when you don't do it. Yep. So <laughs> you might as well fail doing the thing. <laughs> right. Because then yeah. you have a little bit more chance of maybe doing it too. Yeah, exactly. Or learning something from the yes. process, adjusting it and trying again. Mm hmm right? You learn so much from it. One of my favorite quotes, and I know I don't know it off by heart, is that Michael Jordan one about how many shots he missed. Oh, yes. I don't know how many game winning shots he was. I don't remember it totally. But it's just I just love it so much. Like one of the greatest basketball players of all time had so much failure. Mm -hmm. It's just so, so interesting. Yeah, well, you're the ratio of fails has to be really high in order to get the successes or the wins or yeah. however you want to look at yeah. it. And we yeah. think that it shouldn't be. We, for some reason, we think that they're, that we should just get it right the first time. And that's not how it works. Yeah, totally, totally. And I think what the difference between a successful person, and not successful person is a successful person tries things and keeps trying it and keeps mm-hmm. doing it. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and the unsuccessful unsus- person is the one that stops. Right. Right. And that the only difference is, is that successful person pushed it one more time. Mm-hmm. And when it's super duper hard, that's because, you know, you're so close. You're yeah. so close to success. Oh, I, I was feel listening. like that's the hardest part oh, is just getting sure. over that. Yeah. go. I was listening to somebody on a, I don't know, it was a talk show or something the other day. And they were talking about how you know, how she was able to build her brand. And she was like, I reached out to 20 different developers or whatever. And I got rejections with every 20. And it was the 21st time that the person was like, yeah, let's give it a try. And I thought, you know, what would have happened? Because if that was me, probably at like 15, probably even 10, to be honest, I would have been like, okay, this isn't going to work. And it's it's hugely successful now, but it's just that one more time of trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Totally. I love it. And then the last one I was thinking about is they really, really struggle with procrastination. Like 
this is something that comes up constantly within my coaching is procrastination Hmm. that kids are just procrastinating so much procrastinating asking even just sending a text to a friend I don't know if your kids are like this I'm like just ask your friends what they're doing tonight yeah 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 I'm like just ask them yeah (laughs) or else you're stuck at home all of a sudden because everyone's gone (laughs) doing something and you're at home wondering I don't have any friends I'm like you do have friends (laughs) yeah you just put off asking them what they're doing and now they're all off doing something Mm mm-hmm So yeah, procrastination is such like it happens school, socially, like just everything. They just are so worried about everything that they procrastinated or they get sidetracked with all the devices, right? Right. (laughs) What ends up happening is you just elongate the dread, right? Because usually they are kind of dreading it. That's why they don't do it in the first place. Yeah. But like you're just making that, that feeling of dread even longer. It's like creating so much more of it. And yeah. like, let's just do that thing so that we're done feeling right. the dread for that thing. Yeah. Yeah. I like to call it, it's so uncomfortable. You're dragging your uncomfortableness out so long and you're just uncomfortable all that time. Instead, just be uncomfortable for a minute. Yep. And then it feels so good <laughs> whenever, yeah. when your project's done, your schoolwork's done, you made the phone call, you talk to that person, whatever it is, it, it just feels so good after. So I was trying to tell them, like, think of how good it's going to feel when you're done. Oh, absolutely. It feels so good when yeah. you finish it or accomplish it or whatever it is. It just feels so good. Think about that when you push submit. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think that's good advice for all of us in anything that we're doing, right? Like it's never, most things that we do aren't really that fun and yeah. it's not supposed to be, Yeah, but I don't know. The reward is always good. So, right. Yeah. The celebration at the end. Yep. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, you have been on before. I know you've shared with us where people can find you, but can you share that again? And maybe like, if there's anything in particular that you want to share with people right now, I don't know. Just let us know all the things. Yeah. Yeah. So you can find me on Instagram. I'm kind of hit and miss, but I'm trying to do better. But it's at Anxiety Coach Daylene. We've had a lot going on in our family She's here. She's procrastinating. So. <laughs> I, just I am so procrastinating. <laughs> that is true. Oh, I, I got to listen to my own advice. <laughs> Social media, though, is one of those things that I'm like, I don't think it's procrastination. I just look at it as I just. I just don't want to do it. So <laughs> I like to only do stuff that's fun, and it's not always <laughs> fun. So yeah. yep, for sure. But yeah, I do have a website too. It's just dailyandbiome.com. So you can go on there and get all the all the information on how to get a hold of me and all that kind of stuff. Or it's super hard to find me because it's D-A-E-L-E-N-E and there's not that many out there <laughs> with yep. my name. We'll, we'll make so. it easy. We'll link to the things in the show notes so people can find them there. But yeah, go find her. This is what we all need, people. This is what we need our this is what we need our kids to to need or, or to want. I actually, when I was saying I was with some friends this morning, they were talking about one of their children, them wanting him to work with somebody. And I was like, the great thing about finding coaching for a teen or somebody, when you're the one that's going to pay for it really is Mm -hmm. you can almost disguise, like figure out what it is. If, are they an athlete? Like, what is it that they're struggling with? And you can disguise this in some way as, oh yeah, this person is going to help you in your, with your game, with your basketball right. game or whatever, right. right? Like we can, we can slide it in undercover for them and they don't yes. even, cause sometimes they're hesitant to yeah. have help in another way. Yeah, totally. And what, what I'm teaching teens with anxiety, or I do coach a lot on sports, obviously, cause my yeah. kids play a lot of sports and yeah. sports kids are drawn to me, <laughs> Yeah, but it's all the same. We're all teaching the same exactly. thing to all the teams because yep. It's just all the same it's stuff. All they they need. all need to learn it. And they, it's just, it's such a game changer. Yeah, It's just so exciting. Well, that's what yeah. I love. And that's the thing. I, that's what I ended with. I'm like, whatever you take them to coaching for, like if it's yeah. so they can get better at their sport or whatever it is, they're going to learn all the tools that they need that can be applied in everything else in their life. Cause it's yeah. all the same. 
Yeah. A hundred percent. And I've seen it with my own kids, with my teenagers, my youngest was the one that got to benefit from coaching the most, because of course we knew the benefits of right. it and put him in coaching super young. Right. Yeah. And he's coming out such a strong, confident kid heading out on a mission. And he's just going to be like, kill it out there. And I'm not even worried about him whatsoever because yeah. I know he has all the tools he knows. Yeah. So, so great. So great. Well, thank you so much, Daylene. I, we can just chit chat all the day long. <laughs> I know. I feel like we should live closer together because we would be good friends hanging out I all the think, time. <laughs> I think so too. It's, good. it's a real good time. So, yes. all right, everybody, thank you for being here with Daylene and I today. And we hope you join us again next week. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.